Uh, my name is Mark Jerome Feinstein. Uh, I am a grad student at the BCBH in the clinical psychology program. Dr. Elias Klemper is my mentor, uh, and I'll be moderating this poster session. So uh, we have four speakers today, uh, and I'm going to ask that each speaker cap yourself at seven minutes per presentation, um, which should leave uh, enough time for questions at the very end. So first up, we have uh, Dr. Caitlin Browning, a postdoctoral fellow at the BCBH at the University of Vermont. And they will be presenting on substitutability of Juul and other alternative tobacco products or cigarettes in an experimental tobacco marketplace among, amongst vulnerable populations. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'll get my, my thing up here. All right, do you see just the slides? Okay, great. Um, yes, yeah, so we evaluated um, specifically, yeah, the substitutability of Juul and cigars, little cigars for combusted cigarettes in using the experimental tobacco marketplace. And the experimental tobacco marketplace is a virtual marketplace where researchers can examine demand for cigarettes as a function of increasing price. So in this virtual marketplace, participants make purchases for um, cigarettes, purchases of cigarettes for under escalating price conditions. And so we can look at demand for cigarette. And um, simultaneously, we can look at the substitutability of alternative fixed price uh, tobacco and nicotine products. So as we increase the price of cigarettes, how might purchasing of alternative products um, change? And um, the marketplace, the uh, ETM is really well suited to examine um, cigarette demand and alternative product substitution under conditions that model potential regulatory policies, um, as well as um, using a more real simulated real world tobacco marketplace where there's a diverse amount of products available as opposed to just examining two products um, pitted against each other. And it is used to um, examine, you know, the effects of um, product availability, marketing, labeling, um, and device characteristics, product characteristics, and anything like that. So the purpose of this particular study was to examine or determine de cigarette demand and the substitutability of Juul versus cigarillos and little cigars as a function of increasing cigarette prices among adult daily smokers from populations particularly vulnerable to smoking. And so the participants we have in this data set are 24 smokers um, from individuals with um, affective disorders, um, individuals on opioid maintenance treatment and um, women of reproductive age of socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, as our sort of representation of um, populations of um, individuals highly susceptible or more vulnerable to smoking. So the way that the ETM works is that participants are assigned an account balance based on average cigarette use. You smoke a pack a day about, so you will get about $50 to spend for five days worth of products. So we have them make um, using that account balance products, um, purchasing, uh, we have them purchase products for about a week, five days, and we increase the price of their usual brand of cigarette from 12 cents, 25, 50, $1, and $2 per individual cigarette. And then we keep the price of the fix of the alternative products um, constant. And so this picture shows just an example of uh, the layout of the ETM that we use, the products available to the participant in a particular given session and under um, a particular price condition for cigarettes. And in this study, we had three conditions. So three separate sessions um, that were conducted uh, using a within subject design. So participants experienced each of these three conditions wherein all products were available, 
um, no cigars and cigarillos were unavailable, everything else was, and then a condition wherein jewel was unavailable and everything else was available. So as um, typical convention for these sorts of data, we um, converted the, to um, the purchasing pr data to total nicotine purchase, which allows us to compare it on a, um, uh, the same scale and performed linear regression on the mean data as a function of logged transformed cigarette price. So this figure shows um, that the nicotine purchase of cigarettes um, under each of the escalating cigarette price conditions for e um, each of the three product availability sessions. And generally what you see here is that cigarette purchasing decreases as a function of increasing price and um, this is evident by a significant non-zero slope. Um, so the slope significantly decreased, um, or yeah, negative slope. Um, there was something, I might just be sort of grasping at straws here, but kind of potential trend showing differences in demand intensity. So this is the uh, purchasing of cigarettes at the lowest price point. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that intensity might be lowest when all products are available and highest when Juul is unavailable, but that was not statistically significant. Um, so for our substitutability um, data, these three figures show alternative product purchasing as a function of increasing cigarette price as um, under each of the three um, product availability conditions. And so when all products were available, um, we see that Juul was a significant substitute for cigarettes. And that's indicative by, or indicated by that significant non-zero slope of Juul purchasing. So as cigarette price increased, um, you know, demand for cigarettes went, uh, purchasing of cigarettes decreased and purchasing of Juul increased. And so that's how, that's our measure of substitutability. When um, cigars and little cigarillos, um, or little cigars and cigarillos were um, not available, we saw an increase in Juul purchasing as a function of cigarette um, price, but it did not reach significance. Um, and then finally, when all products, um, or when Juul was unavailable and all products, uh, the other products were available, we really didn't see much of anything in terms of an alternative product substitution. So um, cigars and cigarillos did not really increase. And that blip there, um, the green highlight under the $1 condition is driven primarily by one participant who just happened to purchase a lot of, um, Swisher Sweets that session. And so ultimately these data replicate uh, previous research showing the substitutability of N, specifically Juul, for combusted cigarettes and extends this research to populations particularly vulnerable to smoking. We saw that demand decrease as a function of increasing price and Juul was the preferred substitute when constraints on cigarettes increased. This suggests that Juul could be an important consideration for tobacco regulatory policies, um, such as reduced nicotine content cigarettes. Um, and we did not find any evidence that LCC substituted for cigarettes, but this should be, you know, it's hard to make conclusions off of a null finding. Um, there's a couple limitations worth mentioning. Small sample size, we're still um, trying to round out the study. Um, and get a few more people in. There was a difference between um, some participants experienced those three conditions, the um, product availability, the three sessions in a random order, some experienced it in a sequential order. So that's something um, that we're gonna look into when we have the full data set. And what we plan on doing next is um, I'm moving forward with examining how Juul might substitute for combusted cigarettes um, and the effect of the nicotine dose of um, both Juul and cigarettes um, on that substitutability. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Browning, for that presentation. It's been a couple of years since I've gotten to see nice, clean demand curves like that. Um, up next, we have Dr. Suleiman R. M. Coleman, uh, postdoctoral fellow at the BCBH here at the University of Vermont. Uh, they'll be presenting on examining the association between flavor categories of ENDS and smoking cessation amongst US women of reproductive age, pregnant and non-pregnant. So go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Mark. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Can everyone see that? Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, <clears throat> um, so before I get started, I just wanna point out that this project is being funded by NIDA, the FDA and NIGMS, and we have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So getting into it, roughly 20% of US women of reproductive age report smoking combusted cigarettes. This is about 5% higher than the US national average. Importantly, many women of reproductive age who smoke report using electronic nicotine delivery systems to help quit or reduce their use of cigarettes. And a high percentage of these women report also using ends because they come in appealing flavors. So in this study, we wanted to examine whether women of reproductive age, including pregnant and not pregnant women who use ends flavors other than tobacco are more or less likely to quit smoking. Uh, this study used waves three and four of the PATH data set, which is an ongoing longitudinal study of tobacco use in the U.S. non-institutionalized population. Um, waves three and four, sorry about that, um, were the most current waves available at the time of data analysis. 501 women who reported dual use of conventional cigarettes and ends in wave three were identified, and this sample included women who did and did not report using ends to help quit or reduce smoking. The primary independent variable was wave three ends flavor, and women were categorized according to the flavors they reported regularly using, including tobacco flavor exclusively, or flavors other than tobacco, such as mint or fruit or candy, et cetera. The dependent variable was wave four use of conventional cigarettes and multivariable logistic regression was used to control for age, race, ethnicity, education, and pregnancy status, and all variables were self-report. The results of the analysis indicated a significant interaction between pregnancy status and wave three flavor use, Examination of this interaction indicated that for both pregnant and not pregnant women, use of flavored ends other than tobacco in wave three was associated with a greater likelihood of reporting no use of conventional cigarettes in wave four. That association was somewhat stronger for pregnant women, but more importantly, the pattern of association was the same regardless of pregnancy status. So in conclusion, this study provided some evidence that compared to women who reported exclusive use of tobacco flavored ends in wave three, women who reported using flavors other than tobacco were more likely to have quit using cigarettes in wave four. This association was observed for pregnant and not pregnant women. And these results included women who did and did not report using ends um, to help quit or reduce smoking. So, in summary, use of flavored ends may help women of reproductive age transition away from conventional cigarettes. However, the data presented uh, in this project should be interpreted with caution as they're observational and self-report. Nonetheless, the results may suggest that policies limiting access to flavored ends may have unintended adverse consequences for some populations, such as hindering the success of attempts to quit smoking. So thank you all very much for your attention and thank you to my co-authors and our funding sources. Flying through these, but I, I guess the traditional format of saving questions for the end, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with it. Um, and so up next, we have Dr. Nicholas Goldenson, a behavioral scientist at Juul Laboratories, presenting on differences in switching away from cigarettes and Juul use characteristics among adult menthol and non-menthol smokers who purchased the Juul systems. Hi, everyone.
Can everyone see the first slide? Great. So uh, my name is Nick Goldenson. Um, this first slide just displays my disclosures. And as way of introduction, so uh, recent research indicates that menthol cigarettes comprise approximately 35% of the US market and there are 12 million menthol smokers in the United States. Um, previous um, reports from FDA and systematic reviews um, suggest that smokers of menthol cigarettes have uh, lower rates of smoking cessation and higher rates of nicotine dependence. And um, while the prevalence of um, smoking non-mentholated cigarettes has declined in recent years, the prevalence of menthol smoking has actually remained stable or even increased. Uh, recent data from, uh, that was actually published by the Center for Tobacco Products demonstrates that a significantly larger proportion of menthol smokers report using um, electronic nicotine delivery systems or ENDS in menthol and mint flavors. So the aims of the current study, which was a uh, secondary analysis of the adult dual switching and smoking trajectory studies, um, was to assess uh, switching away from differences in switching away from cigarettes and uh, use of Juul in flavors by menthol smoking, a little bit more detail on the study. So this was a uh, one year prospective cohort study of adult Juul purchasers, so uh, age 21 and older, who were recruited into the study following their purchase of Juul in either retail settings or online. Um, all of the uh, participants in the current study were established smokers. They had smoked more than 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. Uh, they, they had smoked in the past 30 days, and they were either someday or everyday smokers. Um, the analytic sample was composed of over 15,000 adult smokers. The majority were um, non-menthol smokers, but over 40% smoked menthol cigarettes. And um, if you're interested in more detail about this study, uh, we, we actually recently published a, a methods paper um, earlier this year, and also part of this same um, journal special issue. There was a, uh, a manuscript that focused specifically on switching away from cigarettes, which we defined as um, no smoking in the past 30 days, um, that, but that but did not look at differences by menthol smoking. So this first figure um, displays um, switching at uh, each of the six follow-ups post-baseline. So in the ADJUST study, there was a uh, initial baseline assessment, and then there was a one, two, and three-month follow-up, as well as a six, nine, and 12-month follow-ups. Um, at each of the follow-ups, participants had reported whether they smoked in the past 30 days. And like I said before, switching was operationalized as a no response to um, the past 30-day smoking question. Um, and you can see at, at each of the six follow-ups, the proportion of menthol smokers that reported past 30-day switching was significantly higher than um, smokers of non-mentholated cigarettes. When we aggregated the data across all of the six follow-up assessments, um, menthol smokers had 17% greater odds of reporting switching across the one-year period. Uh, this, the second aim of the study was to look at um, differences in um, dual use characteristics, including use of flavors. So this, this next figure um, displays um, primary flavor use that aggregated across the six follow-up assessments. So at each follow-up assessment, participants who reported using Juul in the past 30 days were asked um, which Juul flavor they primary, primarily used or used most often. And um, I should mention that this study was uh, conducted in two thousand, beginning in 2018 and extending into 2019. So at the time of the study, um, Juul was available in eight different flavors, two different tobacco flavors, which is the, the category on the far left, Virginia tobacco and classic tobacco. Uh, it was also available in menthol and mint flavor. And then the um, other flavor category or non-tobacco menthol mint was composed of four separate flavors, um, mango, fruit, creme and um, cucumber. And so you can see um, that um, non-menthol smokers, almost four times as many reported primarily using Juul in tobacco flavors across the follow-up period, whereas um, over twice as many menthol smokers reported using Juul in menthol and mint flavors, and fairly large proportions of both reported using the non-tobacco uh, menthol mint flavors, the largest percentage of that was um, mango. 
So in conclusion, um, although switch rates were high among both um, menthol and non-menthol adult smokers who purchased Juul, um, they were significantly higher for menthol smokers across this one year follow-up period. Um, over twice as many menthol compared to non-menthol smokers use Juul in menthol and mint flavors. And the availability of ends in menthol flavors may be particularly important for smokers of menthol cigarettes who would not otherwise quit. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions, but did you say we were waiting till the end? Yeah, if you don't mind, we'll just uh, sure. have our fourth presenter go ahead. And uh, so thank you for that presentation. And then up next is Dr. Saul Schiffman, a professor at the University of Pittsburgh, presenting on changes in dependence over one year among adult smokers who switch completely or partially to the use of the Juul system. And can you see my screen with the title and so on? Perfect, okay. So, oops. Uh, I'm going to go back. Uh, so I'm going to be presenting on uh, the trajectory of dependence uh, in the very study that uh, Nick did me the favor of introducing. Uh, as people, uh, smokers switch from smoking to using Juul, and I'll, I'll get into the details. Uh, by way of disclosure, this study was uh, sponsored by Juul. I consulted Juul, and my co-authors are uh, employees of Juul. By way of background, of course, uh, uh, e-cigarettes or ends are meant as substitutes for smoking to help smokers switch, and they deliver nicotine. And accordingly, uh, we would expect some continued dependence uh, as smokers switch. Um, and in fact, there's both uh, theoretical reasons laid out by uh, colleagues and by uh, FDA as well as empirical data to suggest that some level of dependence is actually necessary to facilitate smokers switching from uh, cigarettes uh, to, to uh, ends and Juul in particular. I don't think I need to introduce uh, Juul uh, and Nick has introduced the study. So you already know it was a longitudinal cohort study of people who purchased Juul and you can see here the schedule uh, of follow-ups. and. Uh, we had two aims in these particular analyses or two research questions. One was to ask what happens as a smoker goes from uh, smoking to using Juul, what happens to dependence? How does dependence on Juul in the same subject compared to their dependence on smoking? And the second is what happens over time as people are using Juul uh, over a period as long as 12 months? So I'll be addressing both of them. Uh, this uh, sample uh, had uh, a little over 17,000 uh, established smokers. A complication in analyzing data like this is the issue of switching. As Nick has shown you, uh, a lot of the smokers reported no past 30 days smoking at various time points. That's something that could vary across time points. And that complicates analyses of switching because there are two uh, empirically established relationships. First, that the people who had the highest levels of cigarette dependence were least likely to switch. And so baseline cigarette dependence is gonna be related to switching probability. And secondly, conversely, that those with higher dependence on Juul were both cross-sectionally and prospectively more likely uh, to switch. So the bottom line is that the analyses have to take into account people's switching status, and I'll walk you through that. A second complication or challenge, if you will, is to have a measure of dependence that actually allows us to compare dependence on Juul versus dependence on cigarettes. And that requires not only that it be validated for each of those products respectively, but that it measure dependence on the same metric so that the data are actually quantitatively comparable. And fortunately, the PATH investigators uh, developed just such a measure, which they refer to as the Tobacco Dependence Index. Uh, so you can use it to compare across. As you've seen, this is a very large sample. And so testing for significance uh, kind of misses the point because even tiny effects are significant. So you have to ask what's really meaningful. 
uh, and uh, there's the idea in the literature of a minimally important difference or MID. And the way we establish the MID for this scale is to say, how big is the difference in month one joule dependence between those who switched at month two and those who didn't, remembering that higher joule dependence predicts uh, switching. And what we see is the difference is pretty small. It's 0.24 points on this uh, one to five scale. And so uh, you'll see, I'm gonna take that into account in how I show you the data. So this shows you the initial transition as people go from baseline cigarette dependence to their reported joule dependence at one month. And what we see is that both for the people who switched completely, that is, who are not smoking at month one, and for those who are smoking who are dual users, there's a, both uh, a decline in dependence, which is both statistically significant and above that MID threshold. What you also see here is that at baseline, the people who end up being dual users at month one have higher cigarette dependence. And that's the uh, finding that I already shared with you, which is it, it actually goes causally and temporally the other way. That if you have higher baseline cigarette dependence, you're less likely to switch. And therefore you show up at month one as a dual user, you're still smoking. But what we see uh, is that for both groups, their dependence has declined going from cigarette dependence to dual dependence. And that's consistent with cross-sectional data that we and others have published. Uh, but this gives us a longitudinal within subjects perspective on this transition. So turning to changes over time, we again have the complication of switching, which in this case varies from observation to observation. You can be not switched at month two, but switched at month three or, or vice versa. So I'm gonna show you the data uh, in three different ways that we've analyzed it. One is looking at all of the data and counting on the analysis uh, to adjust for their switch status as a time bearing covariant. The second is meant to really address kind of what you might think of as the worst case or torture test question, which is what about the people who were not smoking and said at each and every time point out to 12 months that they were using fuel. That's where you might expect dependence to be going up as they're using the product longer and longer. And finally, just for symmetry, we also looked at the people who um, were not switched at every single time point, but were using Joule at each and every time point. So this is the overall uh, data. And, and what you see, first of all, you see again in the dashed line, the decrease in dependence that occurs as people transition as, from baseline to cigarette dependence to dependence on Joule. And then what you can see is that the trend is pretty much flat over time. In fact, the analysis tells us that the, um, the model uh, change in dependence is 0 0.01 points per month, very far below that 0.24 uh, MID, even over all 12 months. Um, now here are the torture test folks uh, who were using Juul at every single time point and not smoking at every single time point. And what you see, again, not unexpectedly, their dependence is slightly lower at baseline, because remember, these are the people who switch. And again, though, even though they're using Joule at every single time point, we don't see a meaningful increase uh, over time. And again, the, uh, the average change per month is 0.01 points per month. And finally, here are the people who are switched at every single time point. Again, they have higher baseline cigarette dependence, uh, rather who are smoking, sorry. They have higher cigarette dependence, which goes with the fact that they didn't switch, but they too show no material increase over time. So uh, the data tell us two answers the two fundamental questions we had. One, that dependence decreases as people transition from smoking and their dependence on cigarette to their subsequent dependence on Juul. And secondly, that even among the people who use Juul exclusively at every single time point out to 12 months, we don't see meaningful increases uh, in dependence. Uh, the increase is, is 0.01 per month. 
So uh, I think that gets us to where uh, folks have been patiently asked, waiting to ask questions. Now we open the floor up for, for the kind of free-for-all section of the poster session. So go for it. I have a quick question. Um, Saul, thanks for that. Uh, clearly broken down presentation of a very complicated topic. Um, I, I am curious, so you may have gone into this and I may have missed it, but I'm curious if you measured or if you have data on the cigarette dependence change from month one moving forward or from baseline to month one and then subsequently among those who continue to use both products. No, I should have highlighted this. It's in the slides, but I didn't call it out. The way the study worked, uh, cigarette dependence was measured only at baseline. And then in the follow-ups, only jewel dependence was measured. So, so a gap in the data is that we don't know what's happening to people's cigarette dependence among those who are smoking. What I would expect, and I, I'm guessing this might be what you have in mind as well, is that as they're transitioning, that cigarette dependence is going down and maybe dual dependence is going up as they're essentially what we, what we may be seeing, frankly, what we'd like to see is that people are transferring, transitioning dependence from toxic cigarettes to, uh, to Juul and presumably it would happen with some other ones as well. But we do not have data on cigarette dependence at the follow-up time. And a quick follow-up question to that, and this is a, a clarifying question, but uh, can we remind me, is the tobacco dependence index, or for that matter, any dependence measure that you know of, ever used to measure overall nicotine dependence, regardless of whether it's electronic or combustible tobacco? Yes, sort of. So, so um, what the PATH survey did really as a practical matter, because you don't want to take someone who says that they use several products and, and chain them to their computer for an hour filling out dependence measures. The way the PATH survey worked is, if you used ENDS, you were administered the scale for ENDS, no matter what. If you used cigarettes only, you were asked about cigarettes only. If you used any two other products, ENDS aside, you were asked about, about your tobacco dependence. So it's a sort of aggregate measure, but to be honest, and I had a role in developing this measure in a past life, um, I have my doubts whether that's a meaningful question to ask people who are smoking cigars, chewing tobacco, and using hookah to say, how would you evaluate your overall? It's a concept we as researchers and clinicians can try to comprehend, but I'm not sure it's a self-reportable. So if you look at the original paper uh, by David Strong, you'll see in there um, the measures from people who, who filled out this aggregate uh, questionnaire. Uh, I hope that answers your, your yeah, question. Yeah, thanks. I have a question for Caitlin. <laughs> Um, Caitlin, and forgive me if I have a knowledge gap around this, but in the ETM, when they increase the prices of cigarettes, do is there a way to measure, or does it just take into account the actual price, but not the taxing on it? Because I know there are all these proposals now around taxing cigarettes and ends the same. So is there a way to manipulate the ETM to account for that and see what the effects would be if taxing on ends and cigarettes were the same and what the effect would be on the market then? Yeah, um, absolutely. So in the way that this study is um, set up and more of the like original um, ETM studies, it's just sort of a flat price. For example, the, the price of the jewel pods and this was based on just kind of general price in Vermont right now, you know, at the time the study was developed. Um, um, Warren Bickle's group, particularly uh, Derek Pope has done um, some work on taxes and subsidies of um, um, cigarettes and 
um, I believe it was taxes on cigarettes and subsidies on e-cigarettes. Um, I believe, Mark, you might know more too. Um, but yeah, so you can basically apply that um, in any way that um, is meaningful in terms of the kind of question you want to ask. Um, in terms of the way tax, I, I don't know of any study that's um, evaluated taxes comparably to cigarettes and e-cigarettes, or um, yeah, e-cigs. Um, but the ETM platform is certainly um, well suited for those kinds of manipulations. The way I think about it, tell me if I've got this right, Kate, is uh, from the participant's point of view, and really from a real consumer's point of view, there's no difference. In other words, how much of it is taxed, how much of it is priced, they just, it's the total price. So the way these studies are done is uh, you just adjust the, if you're studying an increase in tax, you just adjust the price upward um, because that's what the consumer pays regardless of what part goes away. Yeah, and that's my understanding too. I believe that previous study Pope showed a sort of like um, a nice parallel between the effects of subsidies and taxes and from some other research that have looked at the effects of those, it, it I mean, it kind of depends on what the participant is told about, um, you know, this is a tax, this is a subsidy, but really it is, it just comes down to um, price, as you said. Right, I think what the, what I've at least been reading from the harm reduction community is that the concerns are from different states saying we're gonna tax ends the same or as heavily as we would tax combustible cigarettes is how how is that legitimate when you're trying to pass a harm reduction measure like ends um, to tax that as heavily or more heavily than combustible cigarettes like how how is that a legitimate path forward when you're trying to reduce combustible cigarette smoking and so you know to see what pressure that puts on the market um, in terms of moving people away from combustible cigarettes would be sort of an interesting um, study to look at is just sort of where I was headed. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that is an interesting point. Um, um, I just lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you have something to add? I'll distract you with another question. Um, you said that uh, to do the data, you sort of equivalized all the products by the amount of nicotine purchased. And I understand the principle. I don't understand the mechanics. How do you, how do you equate uh, amount of nicotine purchased in a jewel or in snooze to that in a cigarette? What, what's, what's, what's the math? What's the metric? Sure. So we just basically just convert, you know, you purchased um, four jewel pods. I believe they're about 40 milligrams. It's the total nicotine content that we equate it to. And we use for, for usual for the usual brand cigarettes, which vary across participants and is individualized. You know, we go with the average nicotine content in combusted cigarettes. Content or delivery? Content. Okay. But of course, yeah. a lot of it is not absorbed by the human user. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah. And that's definitely, there's been um, not only with just nicotine content, but the way to sort of fairly compare the different purchases um, on the same scale. Uh, researchers have done it in different ways. Um, I just can like, see how that's a challenging issue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, especially when we're when we're looking at things like a pod versus, you know, you can purchase individual cigarettes. The units matter, um, you know, one pouch of skull versus one piece of gum. Like, so there is um, a lot of, um, barriers to that but um you know it's it's a still relatively new paradigm so there's certainly um work to be done actually if you don't mind circling back i have something to add about taxes and subsidies i um i'm not published on taxes and subsidies specifically but i did work on the series of studies and actually helped program the etm itself 
So you can collapse taxes and subsidies into just the final output of the price. But because of the way that it's set up, participants actually load up their kind of shopping cart with all of the goods that they want. And then their, their purchase decision isn't finalized, much like in real online shopping until they hit the checkout button. And so if you wanted to make more salient the impact of taxes or subsidies, you standardize the price to its normal level, and then you apply the tax or subsidy at checkout and you make it really salient that this is the price change. And you can actually investigate those as a separate manipulation from just Yeah, for, for, I just will jump in for all it's worth, you know, the ETM is incredibly powerful for being so malleable and you can evaluate so many different things um, that are really important empirical questions like that. And there's always that sort of uh, balance between, you know, scientific rigor and also the real world ecological validity of these things. Um, I mean, you saw the example of the ETM po um, layout that we displayed. I mean, it's kind of a clunkier Amazon. It's actually not terribly user friendly, the one that we use. Um, and, you know, yeah, there's no taxes associated with ours. Um, but those are a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with, with it. And so um, it's certainly... Um, yeah, very malleable to uh, your particular research question. In the last two minutes, yeah, I have a, a question for Nick. Um, I wonder, you know, I hadn't seen those data on the, uh, the fact that menthol, folks who smoke menthol cigarettes are more likely to switch over to Juul than those who smoke non-menthol cigarettes. I wonder if you have any thoughts on why you might be seeing that pattern or what might be driving that. Yeah, so um, the data that I showed was unadjusted, but um, we have conducted analyses where we've adjusted for smoking characteristics, um, socio-demographics, as well as dual use characteristics. And we still see a significant association, slightly attenuated. Um, the odds ratio drops to about 1.13 instead of 1.17. Um, you know, so it's not wholly accounted for by smoking characteristics, you know, things like dependence, um, frequency of use. Um, we, we did also test the, uh, the interaction between flavor use and um, menthol smoking. Um, we, we didn't actually see any differences in um, switching by flavor among menthol smokers. Among the non-menthol smokers, the ones who are actually using the menthol mint flavors had higher switching rates than um, those using tobacco flavors. So we're still working on and disentangling some of these associations, but um, yeah, I don't know that we necessarily have a, a leading hypothesis at, at the moment. It does, it does suggest something that's consistent with what people have reported from qualitative interviews, which is that when smokers are switching, they actually want the e-cigarette to taste different than their cigarette. They want to uh, change. Uh, so we don't know that that's the case, but it's at least uh, not inconsistent with the finding with the report. Because it's really the non-menthol smokers who benefit from using a menthol fuel. Although it's a relatively small, small number menthol. number of them that are using the flavor, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it brings up a lot of questions. Questions are us. <laughs> It looks like it's at six o'clock. Mark, should we wrap it up? Yeah, um, yeah it's at six o'clock. Thank you all for those wonderful presentations. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.